My name is Mario Benelli, and I'm an assistant professor of reproductive physiology at the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Florida here in Gainesville. Uh, my topic for the, for, the repro, for the repro school video series is synchronization. And the synchronization, of course, it ties right in with the context of artificial insemination. But as you'll see today, it, also, uh, it is also very important for other aspects of the reproductive management of the beef herd. So let me share my presentation. Here we go. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm here uh, once again at the Department of Animal Sciences and my email here is on the bottom. Please feel free to call me, contact me, email me if you need any more information about uh, this talk today and I'll be really glad to uh, try to assist you. So the topics for today uh, and take home message. Uh, so first, the synchroni I'll talk about the synchronization in the context of the Florida cow-calf operation. Uh, and the principle, the guiding principle is that synchronization is critical for breeding early in the season, winning heavier and uniform calves, and producing heifers that will be mature in, the first, in their first breeding season. Then I'll talk about synchronizing cows. And the principle here is that synchronization helps reestablishing cyclicity postpartum and concentrates breeding early in the breeding season. Finally, I'll talk about synchronizing heifers with the guiding principle being synchronization has tense puberty attainment and concentrates breeding early in the breeding season. So I'll start with this picture of a very important moment in any cow-calf operation. This is the moment of winning. So the cows are here to the right and to the left are the calves that uh, are, have just been weaned. Uh, this is the moment in which the beef producer will realize its profits. It will, uh, in many situations here in Florida, uh, the calves will be sold right at winning and the all the investment that was put in these cows from the time of breeding uh, will be uh, finally monetized and the bottom line of the producer is going to appear at this moment. But this is a very important moment. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this in mind as the end result of a synchronization program, which is the very end, which is the production of the calf that will generate the money for the producer. So let's put this in the time context. And to be able to do this successfully, I want to go through the exercise with you of having two uh, calendar years, 2019 and 2020, and a little bit of 2018. And we can see two subsequent breeding seasons, starting with the calving season here in Nialo, then the, the subsequent breeding season, and the winning of the calves they were just calves at the beginning of the previous season. Then the result of the breeding that happened here in 2019 is the calves that were produced at the end of 19, beginning of 20. Uh, these calves, of course, will also be weaned. And right after the calving season, those same cows were started their breeding season uh, to which they are pregnant right now in November of 2020. I also indicate here the uh, uh, moment of winning. Uh, so this moment of winning, this is established by the producer in their particular operation. And it can be set, for example, at, uh, at having calves at least 210 days of age at the moment of winning. So what, what we have here on this gray bar is the distribution of calves uh, uh, in the moment that they achieved 210 days. So the first calf that was calved here in the calving season, it, uh, it achieved 210 days here on the very first, uh, on the beginning of this gray bar. And the last calf that, that calved uh, mid-February 
was achieved 210 days right here at the end. So the interval between the last calf born and the day of winning was set for 210 days. And this can be set differently according to the operation. And what we see here is that again, so the youngest calf will, will, will be about 210 days at winning, but there will be heavier calves. There'll be calves that are, that are older at the time of winning because they calved earlier. Another point of interest when you're trying to set up this kind of diagram for your operation is to know that from the beginning of breeding season to the beginning of the calving season, which is the gestation interval, you should calculate to be about 280 days. So that interval is also very important. And finally, another point that is, that's important in terms of reproductive management is to know that the heifers they will be entering their first breeding season here are the ones that were calved on the previous calving season and they will be between 12 and 15 months of age the ones that are born early in the calving season they'll be 15 months of age when they are getting ready to be bred as yearlings while the ones that are the latest to be born on that calving season they will be to only 12 months of age when the sub the, the breeding season comes when they will have to be bred. So keep those in mind. And uh, remember that this kind of diagram is very simple to put together. This is one real example from our operation here at the beef unit at the University of Florida. And it starts at winning, and then you can move forward, uh, backwards rather, to calculate your calving season and when your breeding season uh, has to be. And you can do that over a course of years. Uh, and see if you're able to uh, keep consistency in your calving and if, uh, yeah, and if the calving is coming as planned. And uh, with that, uh, the moment of winning in uh, the, the size of the, of the calves when they're ready to be weaned. So what we really want in terms of management, we really want to have as many calves uh, winning uh, heavy uh, as possible. So to have a greater proportion of calves win heavy, you need to have a greater proportion of calves born early. And for that, you need a greater proportion of cows breeding early in the season. So keep this as a guiding principle for the cow-calf operation here in Florida. If, you, if your bottom line is how many pounds of wind calves you have, you want them to uh, win as heavy as possible, and that means to be the oldest as possible. And that's associated with, with of course, we've been calved early in the calving season, and that's only possible if their moms got bred early in the breeding season. Those are important principles that will guide, uh, uh, of course, the reproductive success of your operation, and also they are strongly related with synchronization, which I'll show you next. Also, to have a greater proportion of mature heifers in their first breeding season, so we have, you would like to have as much as possible of them mature when they enter the breeding season, a greater proportion of heifers should be born early in that calving season. So again, breeding early, calving early, winning heavier, uh, and being heavier at the moment of the subsequent breeding season for heifers are all important components of the economic health of your beef operation. This is what you want. You like to have a crop of calves that is uniform and healthy and is uh, ready to develop uh, to winning uh, when time is appropriate. And, that's, and that can be achieved through synchronization. So here's the limitation. Let me show you this graph and spend a little time uh, to uh, discuss with you what it means. So this graph shows during a 90 day breeding season that you can see here at the bottom, the proportion of cows that are not pregnant and how that changes over those 90 days. So on day zero, that means on the beginning of the breeding season when, when the bulls are released uh, with the cows, you have 100% of open cows. 
then as the bulls uh, start to work and breed those cows, you're going to have less and less open cows until, sorry, until the end of the breeding season, and this time 90 days, in which about 80% of the cows are bred, the only 20% will remain open. So see that if, uh, if only a bull, uh, uh, if only bulls are allowed this, only it's an operation with natural breeding, uh, you're going to have this slow and steady uh, number of proportion of cows that are becoming pregnant along the breeding season. Now, this is what happens if you use a synchronization protocol. So any synchronization protocol, I'm not going to give you uh, any specific example, uh, could be any other one, not just this one. But this is an experiment in which the control group had only natural service. And you can see the proportion of cows that are not pregnant and they are in it is decreasing throughout the breeding season. Now look what happens when you have when you add a synchronization protocol and a one shot of artificial insemination and then release the bulls. So the response to that synchronization is that you're going to have a sharp decline in the number of open cows right on the very beginning of the breeding season that is associated with that artificial insemination. And then after the bulls are put the, are, are, are placed with the cows, they will keep remaining, uh, uh, they will keep going, uh, uh, becoming pregnant at a, again, at a uh, lower rate. At the end of the breeding season, the cows that only stayed with the bulls got about 60% uh, pregnant, on 70% uh, pregnant on that example, while about 25% uh, remain open in the cows that received the protocol and then uh, were submitted to natural service. So what you see is that just the fact that they were synchronized and received one AI uh, caused a sharp decline in the number of open cows. And here's a good example. So to obtain 50% of the cows bred, you just need 10 days of the breeding season. That those, those are the 10 days that you use for the protocol. While it will take over 50 days for natural service to generate that same result. So just, the, just because you're using a protocol, you are really shifting your, uh, uh, the day of breeding. And, and that's going to have a clear effect on the, on, the, on the day of calving and again on the weight of your, um, of your calves when they are weaned. So the take home point here is that submitting the animals to a synchronization protocol in the beginning of the breeding season increases early breeding. And uh, I made the point earlier that this is economically important for the operation. So uh, overall, for, for this first part, the synchronization is critical for breeding early in the season, winning heavier and uniform calves, and producing heifers that will be mature in their first breeding season. Let's go to the second topic, which is synchronizing cows. So here, let's take a look at the, uh, at the reproductive cycle of the cow from parturition. She undergoes a, a period of postpartum quiescence in which her reproductive tracts has to involute from the previous pregnancy. Then she will start cycling again, and then she can be inseminated either artificially or by natural service. She'll conceive, go through gestation, and then she'll have another uh, parturition in another calf. And this cycle will hopefully uh, keep going year after year, so she'll have one calf for every year. Now let's put a few days here on this system. So be, between parturition uh, and the time that her reproductive tract has completely evoluted and she's ready, uh, again, in terms of, of her reproductive tract to conceive, it takes on average 30 days, not less than that for beef cows. Then it takes another 30 to 60 days for her to start cycling again. So these 30 days is just for the evolution, and then, and then another 30 to, six, to 60 days for, for, for the cow to start cycling again. But then at that time, there should be the beginning of the breeding season. If you put together the time of calving 
then the recovery, it's already time for her to get bred again, uh, either artificially or by natural service. So I'm indicating this here as the bulls in moment. That breeding season may have different uh, lengths. Uh, let's say, for example, a 90 day breeding season as an example. Now, look, this is the proportion of cows that were cycling 10 days before the beginning of the breeding season uh, at our University of Florida uh, Beef Research Unit last year. So we started them uh, at breeding at about uh, 45 days postpartum. And depending on the category, for example, if they were, if they were mature cows, 55% of them were already cycling. This is 10 days prior to the beginning of the breeding season. So it's almost at the moment of starting breeding. However, if you take, for example, the, the two-year-old heifer, the heifer that's going for her second calf, only 7% of them are cycling. So they're not ready to, uh, to be bred. Uh, so when we put these numbers here on the context of our schematic, what we see is that at the moment that you will start the breeding season, you might have between 10 and 60% of your animals cycling. Not all of them are cycling. Some of them are still in anestrus. They have not recovered cyclicity. So even if you put them here uh, together with the bulls, the bulls are not gonna be able to do anything because they are not cycling. So when we look uh, at our uh, curve here that I showed to you before, that's the proportion of non-pregnant, that explains that the beginning of the breeding season, those initial 20 days, very few cows get pregnant because there will be a proportion of them that are just not cycling. So this is the cow challenge, low cyclicity at the beginning of the breeding season. Uh, another point that, that I wanna mention uh, is that again, for them to be cycling, and I'm talking about cyclicity all the time, I wanna define cyclicity. What does cyclicity mean to the cow. And for this, I have to go back to the concept of the estro cycle. So when the cows are cycling, they are undergoing continuous estro cycle. The duration of the estro cycle of the cow is 21 days. And it is defined between the time that she shows estrus to the time that she will show estrus again. And on average, it's about 21 days in the cow. So for example, in this example, uh, this heifer, She's the one in estrus because she's standing to be mount, to be mounted. And this one here is mounting her. She could be or could not be in estrus, but this one that's standing for sure, this is the sign of the typical sign of estrus. So what is associated with estrus if you look inside a cow? And then you can go back uh, to uh, the class of Taylor. She showed some anatomy uh, of the reproductive tract. And this is a typical ovary of a cow that's in heat, will have a very large follicle. If we take a cross section of this follicle and look, and look in the microscope, this is what we're going to see. This is the follicle, it's full, it's full of liquid. And what we see inside is the egg or the oocyte. So at this moment, when there's a large follicle, which is almost ready to ovulate, this animal will be in heat. If you fit, if you fit, this animal with an astrotech, the astrotech will be activated. That means because of mounting, some of that paint will have been rubbed, which is a clear sign of estrus. What happened 28 to 30 hours after estrus is ovulation. So ovulation is the release of that egg that is inside the follicle to be, to be ready for fertilization by semen that we introduced by artificial insemination or that the bull introduced by natural service. And uh, that uh, the, the, the union of the egg with the sperm will make the embryo and that, that's necessary for uh, the establishment of pregnancy. This is a picture of the moment of ovulation that was taken from uh, the ovary of a, of, a, of a woman in a clinic. Very difficult to uh, observe this phenomenon, but this is just the moment in which that fluid is leaving the follicle and uh, with that the oocyte the egg will be released for uh, for insemination then after ovulation 
there's the formation of a corpus luteum. So you probably also saw that on Taylor's presentation. This is the corpus luteum right here on the top of this ovary. And by ultrasound, we can see it as a structure with a different texture uh, that's present uh, in the surface of the ovary. So if the cow is showing, the cow or heifer is showing heat, then she's ovulating, and then she's forming a corpus luteum, that means that she's cycling and she will repeat this cycle in that on average every 21 days. Now, if a cow is or a heifer uh, has a 21 day cycle, here comes the second challenge. So those are those first 20 days of the breeding season that I discussed with you. At any given day, about 5% of the cycling cows will be in estrus. So the second challenge of the cow is that, that, is that uh, um, they, can, they, will be, they will be at any of 21 days of the estrus cycle. So when we release the bull, we're gonna have two challenges. First one is that only 10 to 60% of them will be cycling. And second, even if they are cycling, they could be at any days of the estrus cycle. So it's clear that this is the reason for why uh, when you do natural breeding, you have a, the cows will get pregnant, but at a, uh, uh, a slower rate than if we did synchronization. So, so this is what I'm showing you again. The synchronization does two things for cows. One, stimulate cyclicity, you see? From on, on, on this experiment here is not that that all this uh, that all of these cows were cycling. You see, you were 45 days postpartum. So again, it could be between 30, 40, 60, uh, 30, 40, 50 percent of them would be cycling, but the majority of them will not be cycling. So one of the things that the synchronization protocol does is to stimulate them to cycle. And the second thing it does is to concentrate the onset of estrus to two to three days. So this is the synchronization portion that we are used to think about. So instead of them coming in heat at random at any of those 21 days, uh, they will be all concentrated and all of them will be stimulated and will come in heat in an interval of two to three days. This is why we, we were able to get a number of them pregnant over 50% right on the very first day that you're bred by artificial insemination uh, on this example here. Uh, this is the distribution of estrus in synchronized mature cows at our University of Florida beef herd in 2019 and 2020. And as I mentioned, what you can see is that 36, 48, 60, and 72 hours after the end of the synchronization, synchronization protocol that I will show you in a minute, you have these proportion of cows coming in heat. So it does concentrate heat uh, in a, in a, uh, in a 48 uh, about hour period that is distributed, but this is the proportion of cows that, that came in heat in each of these moments. Uh, and you can see that's pretty concentrated instead of 5% of them coming in heat every 24 hours. Let's talk about protocols. So I guess that by now you were convinced that, that at least for cows, and I'll talk about heifers in a minute, you have two main um, advantages of synchronization. First one, because, because of the drugs are, they are used in the protocols, you will induce cyclicity. So some of the cows that were in anestrus, they will be induced to start cycling and that cycle is fertile. And the second aspect, is that they, they will in fact be synchronized. So instead of being at random days of the astro cycle, they will all come in heat or the majority of them will come in heat in two or three days after the end of the protocol. But let me show you what are the drugs that are used in these protocols. So basically in the United States, you can use three types of drugs. One is the prostaglandins, the other ones are the progesterone releasing devices or the sitters, or they uh, which are or which are uh, shown here, or MGA, which is an oral uh, source of progestin, 
and you're going to have to use a source of GnRH. These are some of the commercial formulations that are available in the market, both, of, both for prostaglandin and for GnRH. And in, in the other portion of this toolbox I already mentioned is the AstroTech, which is a heat detection patch that is attached to the back of the cow or, or heifer. And as she's being mounted, that collar will be rubbed off and you'll be able to tell which cow, which animal had been in heat and which ones that did not show heat. So this is the protocol that we use here at the University of Florida. It is called the uh, PG six day cedar and time artificial insemination. And I'll show you, you it in a little bit more detail. So basically you will start that protocol. We do, we, so here at, at our herd, uh, every animal has at least one opportunity to be bred by AI. And then 14 days later, they are released with the bulls. This is our management practice here, but, but all of them, heifers and cows, they get uh, one shot of AI following this protocol. So on this protocol on cows, they will start at least 45 days of a postpartum, no, no earlier than that. They will receive a cedar device, which is that progesterone releasing device that's placed intravaginally in the cow together with a shot of GnRH. Seven days later, that uh, cedar device is removed. The cow receives a shot of prostaglandin and they are observed for heat for the next three days and a half. Every morning and every afternoon, uh, Mr. Danny Driver, which is the manager of our uh, uh, beef units, he will uh, check the animals for heat. And the ones that they show heat in the morning, they'll be inseminated in the afternoon. The ones that show heat in the afternoon will be inseminated on the next morning. He does that for 80, 84 hours. And at 84 hours, the animals that did not show heat, that means the AstroTech was not activated, they will receive a shot of GnRH and they will be timed artificially inseminated. That means they will be artificially inseminated without the detection of heat. Uh, for this example, let me make it very clear. The, the cows that show heat and are inseminated after observed heat, they have much greater fertility than the cows that are inseminated without the observation of heat. So heat is the hallmark, the golden standard of fertility. An animal that's able to show heat is cycling, show all the, uh, the, the, the necessary uh, uh, changes to be inseminated, will release an egg and has a great chance of fertility. Um, I put the name of Zoetis here because they are the, the company that is uh, giving us gener gener generously the hormones that we use for our synchronization protocols, but there's no preference for the company. The company that works best for you uh, should be fine for the synchronization protocols. However, the doses that are prescribed and the moments that you administer each of these drugs is critical for the workings of the protocol. Uh, I'm just bringing back, uh, bringing back this slide so you remember that at the beginning of the breeding season, right at the moment we were getting ready to start that protocol, we only have had 7% of the animals cycling if they were two-year-olds and 50% of them cycling if they were multi-pairs, mature cows. These are the pregnancy rates that, that we obtained by AI here in the first bar. And at the end of the breeding season, which is AI plus natural breeding for these categories of animals, the prima pairs, which are the first calf heifers, then the second pairs, which are the heifers that are going to the third calf, and here are the mature cows. So you can see, this is that category that I showed you, they only had 7% of the animals cycling. So just because we use the protocol, we are, we are able to get 43% of them pregnant at that first AI. And by the end of the breeding season, 80% of them were pregnant. Then if you look at here at the multiparous cows, the mature cows, 55% uh, were cycling. We got 44 of them bred at the very first day of the breeding season by AI. 
And by the end of the breeding season, about 91% of them were bred using the protocol that I showed to you. Uh, a question that just goes back to what I was telling you in the beginning of the presentation is this. How well do cows that calved early in the calving season will do in the subsequent breeding season? And the rationale here would be the cows that calved early, they'll be ready to get bred earlier on the subsequent breeding season. And this is the case. So when you look at, cow, uh, at cows that calve in November, December, January, or February, the cows that calved earlier, say November and December, they had greater pregnancies to the first AI and also the pregnancy at the end of the breeding season than cows that calved later, say January or February, had about 10% points less uh, fertility, both to AI and at the end of the breeding season. So this is just to illustrate once again, the importance of synchronization and the importance of being bred early in the breeding season. So is there a benefit to synchronization if we don't do AI? Here in Florida, uh, artificial insemination is not widespread. Only between eight, eight to 10%, five to 10% of the beef herds will, will, will do artificial insemination. However, from what I've been telling you, it must be clear by now that even if you do not inseminate, the use of a protocol will be very beneficial to your operation. So let's, uh, so let's look at this example of this experiment, a very simple experiment that we conducted in Ona uh, this year. So we use what, what we call timed natural breeding to increase early conception in the breeding season. So here we have a comparison. These are cows and they were submitted to a protocol, uh, just like the one I mentioned to you, that six day sitter, or submitted to no protocol. That's the control group. They were checked for heat. They were not, they were not artificially inseminated. Uh, right, right at the moment in which we removed the sitters, we started the breeding season. That means they were mixed with the bulls right at that moment. And that breeding season lasted 90 days when the bulls were removed. So those were crossbred and multi pairs cows. We did that together with Dr. Felipe uh, Moriel from Ona. And uh, these are the results. So the number of cows in estrus on day seven of the breeding season was 40% for the ones that received no cedar and 70% of the ones that received the cedar. And as I mentioned to you, the, the, having the... Uh, Showing heat uh, will be decisive for fertility. And indeed, the pregnancy of these animals at 45 days of the breeding season, all bull breeding, there's no artificial insemination here, was about 30% in the absence of a cedar. But when we put the cedar, it jumped to 42%. And at the end of the breeding season, it was 91% uh, versus 87%. This is no, no difference. The importance is right here is that you have an advantage, a greater number of, number of animals got pregnant early in the breeding season if they were submitted to a synchronization protocol using a cedar device. So the take home message here again is that synchronization helps reestablish the cyclicity postpartum and concentrates breeding early in the breeding season. Finally, let's talk about heifers. And here, the synchronization has tense puberty attainment and concentrates breeding early in the season. So here are the heifers, and they're uh, all looking at us. And uh, looking at them, we like to, to uh, know which one of these heifers uh, would be able to get pregnant as yearlings in the breeding season. So here's that same schematic that I showed to you before. But now we have here after parturition, the attainment of puberty, and very similar to cows, they will have to start ovarian activity and astrocycles uh, to be inseminated and undergo a full gestation. This also should be put in the context of the breeding season. So they should be cycling here 
when the balls are in or when you or, or when we'll do our first AI. Now, what actually happens when you go out and, exam and examine these heifers is that you're going to have a range in which you'll see between 30 and 80 percent of these heifers are cycling at the at the beginning of the breeding season. So again, if you just let them go spontaneously and do not synchronize them, what's going to happen is that many of these heifers will be achieving puberty during the breeding season and will end up getting pregnant at the end of the breeding season, which as we, as we already talked about, is not the most favorable situation. Just because of what I was uh, uh, mentioned to you before. So again, uh, if they take time to uh, attain puberty before they start getting pregnant, uh, you, you're going to have that uh, distribution of calves that will, that will be... Uh, be calved throughout the calving season uh, and you will end up with some heifers that are open and not a lot of heifers will be pregnant on the beginning of the breeding season. So for heifers we do have a tool for evaluate attainment of puberty and it's called a reproductive tract score. It's done, by, it's done by an experienced technician using ultrasonography in which we evaluate the size and presence of follicles corpus luteum, which is a sign that she has ovulated and she is puberal, and the size of the uterine horns in the reproductive tract. So with that, there is a scale that goes from one to five, being one reproductive tract score of one, a prepubertal animal, and a reproductive tract score of five, a puberal animal that is already cycling. And here you can see uh, Tiago that worked together in our program doing track scores in this heifer in Okeechobee. So this is data that was collected uh, in our experiments. And what we see here is the distribute, each, each of these points, uh, the circles is, represents one heifer. And we can see there is a large, uh, these measurements were, were taken 30 days prior to the beginning of the breeding season. And we can see there is a large variability in what is the reproductive tract score that goes from one to five on these heifers. And, and, and when you look at it, there is uh, 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 there are um, layers of body weight in which they're very similar in terms of their body weight, but they vary dramatically in terms of the reproductive tract score. So just looking at the heifer, uh, you're not going to be able to tell which one is is approaching puberty, has reached puberty, or is far from reaching puberty. But if you examine them and measure the reproductive tract score, you might have an idea of how they are developing towards that maturity. Again, the principle here would be that they should have attained puberty. They should be cycling at the beginning of the breeding season to maximize fertility. So let's look how did this heifers do in terms of fertility uh, after they were submitted to a protocol of synchronization. This is the protocol that we use. Again, that very same protocol that I showed that I showed you before. So all of them received this protocol right prior uh, to uh, uh, to insemination, and they were, they were they and they were all inseminated one time. So these are the pregnancy that we obtain in heifers that had. Uh, the, uh, the reproductive tract scores from one to five that was measured prior to the beginning of the season. This is the pregnancy rate to one artificial insemination. And as you can see, you go from 17%, they have as they had the reproductive tract score of one to all the way up to 46% on the heifers that had a reproductive tract score of five. And that was with the use of one synchronization protocol that all of them had. So here, uh, to maximize fertility of heifers, it is imperative that they have developed and they present a reproductive tract score of at least three or greater at the beginning of the breeding season. Uh, this is their uh, pregnancy rate. So on average, uh, regardless of the reproductive tract score, 
we obtain about 40% of pregnancy on, on to that artificial insemination in our beef herd here at UF. And at the end of the, of the breeding season, we had 81% of them pregnant. Those are uh, multi-breed Brahma influenced heifers from our herd, all yearling heifers. And this is finally the relationship between the reproductive tract score that was measured prior to the beginning of the breeding season and the reproductive performance. So the heifers, they had a reproductive tract score of one or two. They had a pregnancy to that, to that first artificial insemination of 27%. And by the end of the season, about 77%. In contrast, the heifers that started with a reproductive tract score of three to five, they had a pregnancy of about 45% to that very first AI on the very first day of the breeding season. And by the end of the breeding season, 87% of them were pregnant. So there isn't about a 10 point difference in fertility at the end of the breeding season and about a 15 point difference of the, of the half, on the proportion of heifers that got pregnant on the first day of the breeding season. So uh, with this in mind, I would just like to uh, uh, make you aware of, of a program that we, that we have launched. It's called the Know Your Heifer Program, Optimizing Replacement Beef Heifer Development in Florida. And, and that with this program, it is done and associated with the county agents, like the livestock agents that are involved in, uh, with this reproductive school, for example. And we'll go to the ranch, we perform reproductive track score in the animals, and then before the breeding season, and then we go back and uh, do a pregnancy test on these animals, and then we'll evaluate the first potential and then the performance of the heifers in your herd. If you're interested in more information, here's the website. Please check it out. It's a great program that we're starting just this breeding season that's going to put the Florida heifers in the map. With that, I'll finish. I have to thank many of my students, like Cecilia and Felipe, also Leo and Mariana, that are heavily involved in this project. Also, Tiago, Dr. Tiago Martins, he's uh, palpated each one of the heifers that I showed you in the study, and many faculty and producers and friends that we have that have donated animals or lend their animals for us to do our studies. Also the Florida Cattlemen Association that provided funding for some of our projects. And finally to Zoetis that provides the drugs that we use in our synchronization program at the University of Florida Heard. With that, I'd like to finish with an invitation for you to come and visit us, visit our herd, our Brahma herd, our multi-breed herd at the University of Florida, any moment that you wish. And thank you for your attention.